Okay. Well, welcome everyone tonight to the March meeting for the Massachusetts Archaeological Northeast slash Gene Winter chapter uh, meeting. And we would like again to thank Danvers Historical Society for once again hosting us this evening. Um, today we are excited. We are joined by Alyssa Moreau. Is it Moreau? Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, and she is the current crew chief and lab manager for the Great Bay Archaeological Survey, GBAS, and she is a re recent graduate of the University of New Hampshire in anthropology with a minor in Native American and Indigenous Studies, and she will be attending graduate school this fall for historical archaeology at the University of Massachusetts. Boston, which many of you know is like where I went to school. So absolutely love it and so happy that you could come and join us today. So I will turn it over to you, Lisa. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, I would like to start um, by mentioning some people, although they were unable to join us tonight. Um, the principal investigator and director of the Great Bay Archaeological Survey, um, her name is Dr. Megan Howie. She is a professor in anthropology and the Earth Systems Research Center, as well as the director of the Center for the Humanities at the University of New Hampshire. Howie is an anthropological archaeologist specializing in landscape archaeology and interdisciplinary approaches to deep time coupled human natural systems. Foundational to the Great Bay Archaeological Survey in looking for early colonial sites is the importance of shared history and that these stories can only be told in full collaboration. To this end, the project uh, works closely with Paul and Denise Julio, who are respectively the head male and grant, sorry, the head male speaker and grand chief and head female speaker of the Kawasak Band of the Penacook Abenaki people. They are renowned regional indigenous leaders that provide an array of educational, social, religious, and environmental programs to the region. They are also affiliate faculty members in the University of New Hampshire's Native American and Indigenous Studies minor. I would like to begin by acknowledging that wherever we find ourselves tonight, whether that's here in Danvers or on Zoom, that we are on indigenous lands. This picture um, is provided by the Polios. The Great Bay Archaeological Survey takes place in the ancestral homelands of the Penacook, Abenaki, and Wabanaki peoples. Looking east each day to the Atlantic for millennia, indigenous peoples knew their home and continue to know it and steward it today. Indigenous peoples creatively and powerfully navigated the colonial era yet they still saw their unceded homelands largely taken by the end of the 18th century. We acknowledge they continue to endure hardships today because of the resource and land dispossessions that began in the 17th century, which the Great Bay Archaeological Survey explores. We acknowledge and honor with gratitude the land and waterways of the Almabac, or people, who have stewarded in Dakina throughout the generations. In Dakina, as you can see on this slide, um, the ancestral homelands of the Penacook, Abenaki, and Wabanaki peoples of the past and present is called Indakina. According to tribal oral tradition, the Abenaki people have lived in the place now called New Hampshire and the surrounding areas for more than 12,000 years, since before tribal memory. The Abenaki are part of a larger group of indigenous people who called themselves Wabanaki or people of the dawn and from one of many communities connected by a common language family known as the Algonquian family. The Wabanaki were divided into the Western Abenaki, which were located west of the White Mountains in New Hampshire, Vermont, and Quebec, Canada, and the Eastern Abenaki in Maine, Nova Scotia, and Newfoundland in New Brunswick. The Kawasak, meaning people of the white pines, were located in the upper region of the Connecticut River. The Penacook, also called Maribac, were located around Concord, New Hampshire, and North Central Massachusetts. The name means at the bottom of the hill. So the Great Bay Archaeological Survey 
or GBAS, as I'll probably refer to it a few times here, is a community engaged archaeological exploration of social and environmental change during early colonialism, which redating to 16 to 1750 AD in the Great Bay Estuary. We strive to build a community of practice. This fieldwork um, on this project is open to the public and numerous volunteers from all walks of life have participated, aged from 14 to 76 years old. Um, undergraduate students from the University of New Hampshire have been key participants in GBAS, volunteering in the field um, to learn archaeological methods and in subsequent seasons becoming fieldwork supervisors. The goal has been to create an opportunity where students can train, learn, and become leaders, uh, much like myself. Um, here on the slide, we have um, the New Hampshire Scrap, which we offer field work opportunities through. So uh, this is done in collaboration with the New Hampshire State Conservation and Rescue Archaeology Program, administered by the Archaeology Bureau in the Division of Historical Resources of the New Hampshire Department of Cultural Resources. SCRAP is a public participation program for archaeological research, management, and education. Volunteers receive training and can earn certifications. We also have a story map um, titled From the Fragments to Places and Faces of Great Bay. This is an ARC GIS story map. Um, it outlines the project and much of what I am talking to you about tonight. If you would like to return to it for any information, resources, or further investigation of the places and phases of the project. So fieldwork opportunities are usually open every year. However, we have not determined a schedule this year because the project has inspired a series of institutes for K through 12 educators sponsored by the National Endowment of the Humanities, um, Landmarks of History and Culture Programs. Okay, so today environments, both natural and human, are shaped by decisions made centuries ago during what is productive to consider the socio-ecological shock of global colonialism. Building better understandings of these transformative processes requires detailed research in places where these histories are embedded in place. Looking around our world today, it is undeniable that we are living through massive disruptions and radical social and ecological change. Much of it is the result of our broken relationship with our planet. The science indicating we have fundamentally altered the Earth system in irrevocable ways is overwhelming. Many have called this to be marked by the declaration of a new human-dominated geological epic called the Anthropocene. The Anthropocene describes the geological age where human behavior is the dominant influence on climate and the environment. New epic or not, what we do to repair this relationship is one of the most compelling questions of our time. This can seem overwhelming, but ordinary people have lived through thresholds of radical social and ecological change before. A sense of connection can come from looking back to see how ordinary people navigated extraordinary circumstances. So with the Great Bay Archaeological Survey, we are reaching back in time and from the fragments left behind, bringing forward stories of ordinary people who like us lived during a period of massive disruption specifically the rise of, glo of global colonialism. The Great Bay Estuary is the single largest estuarine system on the Gulf of Maine and one of the most complex recessed embayments on all of the Atlantic Ocean with notably high diversity of forest, river, estuary, coastal environments and habitats. Its uniqueness has made it one of the 29 National Estuary Research Reserves. The Great Bay is the drainage confluence of seven major rivers. Um, from south to north, they're listed on this map. They include the Winnicott, Squamscott, Lamprey, Oyster, Bellamy, Pacheco, and Salmon Falls, 
also including several small creeks and tributaries, ocean water from the Gulf of Maine. Estuaries are places where fresh water and seawater meets and are in general highly sensitive ecosystems that provide first alarm indicators about the combined effects of non-climatic human activities and anthropogenic climate stressors. Interannual climate variability and climate change on coastal ecosystems. The Great Bay offers a rich mix of land and sea resources. Mobility along river systems to move from sea to the interior and a milder climate. For millennia, indigenous communities harvested the estuary's rich marine and terrestrial resources sustainably and in seasonal cycles. In the early 17th century, this resource base attracted the attention of the British, who quickly introduced an extractive economy. Fish, saltwater hay, furs, clay from the estuary's mudflats for bricks, and above all, lumber, processed in sawmills for use in shipbuilding, became key commodities part of the, and part of the larger West India trade. This region became an important frontier zone in early British colonialism in Northeast North America. The Great Bay Estuary is an ideal setting or laboratory for research on the socio-ecologic shock of the rise of global colonialism because it is a unique ecosystem that has long interlocked with human history. That means archeology span in the Great Bay presents an opportunity to foreground this region's culture and history in the development of new understandings of the varied roles human societies have played in altering the Earth's biosphere. GVAS focuses on finding and excavating 17th and early 18th century sites to a massive collection of early colonial artifacts, ecofacts, and geospatial data towards this end. Throughout the global colonial world, market incentives came to dominate human interaction with the environment, leading to a drive for intensive exploitation of natural resources as quickly as possible. This unleashed an unprecedented scale of social change. Resource extraction and commercial land use, which ultimately fueled the development of industrial societies. Northeastern North America was no exception. In the late 1500s to the early 1600s, this region was reinscribed as New England, and early colonial exploitation transformed the landscape. Colonists deforested upwards of 80% of the region by the end of the 1700s, and left other natural resources likewise depleted, which we'll, we will further explore. Okay. Skipped ahead. There we go. So GBAS has chased down several early colonial era sites in the Great Bay Estuary, many of which are shown on this map circa 1670, made by Captain John Scott. The map was commissioned to document the earliest lumber processing sawmills. These mills were powered by water through the construction of dams in the estuary's freshwater tributaries. The region's abundant forests were a stark contrast to those in England, which um, the mainland had been largely deforested throughout the preceding centuries there. English colonists saw a specifically appealing extraction opportunity here. The tall, straight eastern white pines of Great Bay were especially sought after commodities for use in British warships as masts. Scottish indentured servants captured in England and sent to New England were forced to labor in the early colonial lumber industry, powered by these dams, which caused destruction to forests and rivers. Before the British arrived, there were no dams, so waterways flowed freely. But by 1670, Scott documented 15 mills, many of which were built at the head of tides. By 1705, there were at least 70 mills. In addition to forest clearing for lumber, each colonial homestead depicted on this map cleared forests for farming, pastures, and heating. This map evidences the rapid, radical, and destructive changes brought by early colonialism. 
No aspect of the Great Bay was unaffected during the early colonial period from the waterways to the forests, to the soils, and of course, the people. Dams at the head of tides are the most damaging kinds of dams because unlike dams further upriver, head of tide dams completely stop the ebb and flow between fresh water of the river and the tidal water of the Great Bay estuary. This stops fish who migrate between the two over their life cycle, known as diadromatous fish. So not only did these dams take the forests, they also took the fish that once relied on these rivers to spawn and thrive. Examples of these would be alewife, blueback heron, American shad, rainbow smelt, Atlantic salmon, Atlantic sturgeon, Atlantic cod, and American eel. Today, across the region, many of the earliest mill dams are the topic of heated debate over their possible removal for ecological restoration. There was just a major victory in favor of this effort last year in the town of Durham, which is where the University of New Hampshire is located. The town voted to remove the first mill dam built there on Oyster River. You guys look up towards the center, you can see Oyster River right up there. Um, this was known as Mill Pond Dam and was originally constructed by indentured servants in 1649. Um, growing up, I lived in Exeter, New Hampshire, where the Exeter Great Dam, another head of Tide Dam, once stood. Exeter's off to the left on this map. This powered a series of mills over um, previous centuries, grist mill, sawmill, and later a textile mill, which largely secured the town's place in the Industrial, industrial Revolution in the 1800s. In 2016, the Exeter Great Dam was removed, allowing the river to run freely for the first time in 369 years. Wow. Yes. <laughs> and since then, the population um, of the, the population of the town's favorite fish, which is the alewife that's on the town seal, um, has boomed. So in short reflection, in my adulthood, it has been very powerful to see the restoration efforts take shape. Um, become fulfilled and see the positive effects that removal of these things has for these ecosystems. Okay, we're spending a lot of time on this map, but it's very important. <laughs> sure. So we get some questions? Um, yeah, let's we'll take one. Has well, I love extra. I've been there recently. Yes. It doesn't seem like there's a dam, but there's still that big wall up there and the water coming down it. That's not a dam, but is that where the dam was? And does that affect the fish being able to get up stream? The fact that there's big, still these big, big walls. Exactly. Yeah. So the Exeter Great Dam was technically a series of dams. Um, there was one that's up further towards the String Bridge, which is a bridge that you cross over to go to town. And there then is the Lower Falls by the Exeter Public Library. And uh, when the dam was in place, there was a fish ladder that allowed the fish um, to travel up. However, um, it's interesting now that it's been taken away because you really can see the difference in the population. So, and I don't want to give incorrect numbers on this, but they've seen the population um, of the alewives returning uh, double by tens of thousands since removing the ladder. And it's comparative to other communities um, that also have these dams in the area. When we look at what is the presence of a fish ladder and how these fish are able to go upriver compared to when it's not there. So the Exeter Great Dam being removed is a really great example that can hopefully lead to more of these headed tide dams being removed. Um, the Mill Pond Dam also in Durham is a huge success for um, this effort as well. So hopefully that kind of answered your question. <laughs> okay, yeah. Okay, so importantly, this map also illustrates the critical point that Great Bay was a colonial frontier zone. Beyond the waterways, the map shows wild animals. You can see deer, bear, and fox, and a Native American settlement up in the left-hand corner. During the 17th century, the Great Bay region 
was the outer reaches of the British Empire in the northeast north um, sorry northeast of North America, which was centered in Boston, of course, and the French Empire, which was centered in Quebec to the north. Um, so some factors contributing to this frontier zone. The settler colonists who came here were driven by economic reasons, not religious ones. Here to state their claim to get rich, they were, as one official described in the documentary research we reviewed, um, rogue. They were, there were illicit taverns, chronic issues with then mandatory church attendance, and mainly, um, or sorry, and many routinely were in trouble with the Puritan-led Massachusetts Bay Colony government. There was also a much more diverse mix of people in this area and interactions than in Puritan Massachusetts, including Quakers, freed indentured Scots, Irishmen, and of course, Native Americans, composed of many closely connected bands of Abenaki peoples who were, powerfully, who were powerful entities in this frontier setting. They daftly navigated alliances and treaties with both the French and the British as these empires battled for control of the region. Eventually, also of African enslaved individuals and chateau slavery were a forced presence in the Great Bay. Something we are presented with often on this project is the realization from members of the public that there were indeed enslaved individuals in this region. Respectfully, this largely hidden history of enslaved Africans in the region deserves much more research and its own space for sharing those stories. Okay, so I wanna kind of go into some of our methods and approaches. As the last slide showed, GBAS uses documentary research by exploring historic records and recollections of the early colonial period to, tell, to help identify areas with possible significant 17th and 18th century occupation. This is another early map, circa 1700, that alleges a large portion of land burned by Native Americans. So you see that in the writing off to the right. Maps like this speak to the colonial narratives that have dominated the history of this region. What is important to consider when viewing this map is the large scale resources extraction of lumber taking place at the time. The information provided on this survey or map permanently inked into it does not capture the shared stories and realities of all of those living in the region, but instead depicts the colonial settler perspective. While documentary research is imperative to the process of archeology, span we have found time and time again on the project that it must be accomplished by further investigation. Sometimes we are introduced to sites through community members that are interested in learning more about something on their property. We recently conducted an investigation that led to the invest, or sorry, led to the identification of an 18th century garrison site, all due to a passionate landowner who was curious about an old stone foundation on his property, which is awesome. Um, the GFAS um, team's amazing project historian, Diane Fitz, who's in this picture here, amassed an impressive record of the family's occupation at this site. But importantly, there were errors throughout the documentation that made it challenging to piece together. This is very common in her research and should remind us all that errors can be found in the historical record. I think this quote is very powerful to the work that we are doing. Um, I'll read it just to put it out into the world. So doing both historical research and digging on this project in the Great Bay Estuary, I have learned that you can't rely on what is written down alone to tell the whole story of the past. You have to also look at what people left behind when no one was watching. That is where the hidden stories of our shared colonial past lie. You can listen to Diane in her own words on the ArcGIS story map and um, stay tuned for our article on this site. All right. So once areas of significance are identified through documentary research, um, recollections and oral histories, we further investigate potential sites. 
These generally fall into two major categories, sites that show clear evidence of cultural features through standing architecture, like the stone foundation I just discussed, or potential sites with no visible surface evidence like this field here. In this picture, you can see the GBAS team building a systematic survey grid. We use total stations to build accurate grids to guide the survey, and we also lay in transects with long tape and compasses. From there, shovel test pits are laid in at regular intervals to cover the entire area of significance. An STP, hopefully you guys are familiar, talking with archaeology people here, um, but they are 50 centimeter squared units excavated at 10 centimeter levels until we reach the subsoil. All the materials are screened for artifacts. And um, once we have um, a few positive STPs and we've figured out where the highest density of artifacts are, we'll further explore by opening up larger test pits, which are usually a meter squared. And from there, um, they can be expanded and exposed into larger blocks. All the field work is documented through detailed and attentive notes, paperwork, and photographs. All artifacts are collected and brought back to the University of New Hampshire's archaeology lab for processing, storage, and this includes cleaning, cataloging, and analysis. So to advance our survey, we draw on new technologies. When we're at a known site and conditions allow, we will use GPR or ground penetrating radar to non-destructively identify possible cultural features to target in excavations. This shows all kinds of subsurface disturbances and allows us to prioritize excavations. Of course, this is challenging in varied landscapes, so it has to be used um, usually in known conditions. Drones are one of the most helpful on our project as they can be fit with different sensors and cover large areas, even wooded ones. This is Earth scientist Dr. Michael Pallas from UNH. He helps um, with our drone technology. Um, in this picture, the drone is fitted with a hyperspectral sen sensor. I do not have a picture that goes along with it, but it's pretty neat that you can use these different technologies for different ends. Um, importantly, these drones are being used to also study the impacts of colonial lumbering, which I touched on before. This is an example of drone imagery from an excavation on the project. Alrighty, so this is a great example of what a dig on GBAS looks like. This is an excavation of a 17th century British garrison site known as the Burnham Garrison. This was located through documentary research and maps and um, then was further excavated through laying in a systematic grid and conducting STPs. You can see how the site has been expanded and further exposed um, through opening up one by one units. Off to the back, you can see the area set up for screening and clipboards and paperwork are laid about with their respective units. Um, in this photo, let me see if I can get my laser pointer here. Okay, so this is the screening area right here. And then this guy in the blue, this is Gick Lunt. Um, he is the Great Bay Archaeological Survey's Community Colonial Period Material Culture Advisor. Um, Dick is a retired naval electric or electrical engineer who has spent his retirement becoming an expert in early colonial material culture. He has worked on digs across northern New England and is a key community member to the Great Bay Archaeological Survey. Uh, towards the left hand side here. Right here. Turn this off. Um, this is Laura Wolfer. Um, she is a community field supervisor on the project. She brings great expertise in colonial material culture and life ways. She is a key team member with superb field skills, which is great to come by. Um, when she is not at digging with us, she organic farms 
and runs a traditional wilderness skills learning center. Um, you can hear more from Dick and Laura in their involvement on the project through our uh, GIS story now. Okay, here is a profile view of the Stone Foundation from this site. Um, in this view, you can see the intricately placed stones um, with smaller ones wedging into place, um, the larger. The total depth of this unit is 94 centimeters below surface, which is about three feet deep. Um, kind of awesome to see too is that this foundation is built on top of the bedrock. Um, and we'll see some more pictures to come, but it's also interesting to show the kind of obstacles we deal with, like this giant root off to the right hand side. Um, this site was in a very um, thickly settled forest, so there were lots of fun roots and rocks to deal with. <laughs> okay, so again, here's another picture of um, the bedrock and pieces that were drilled um, and removed for the structure, which we'll see in this next slide here. Yep. You can see um, the little drill holes um, in the bedrock for the removal, but also the repurposing of the stone. Okay, and this we can see the expansion um, that we can really see in the first picture. This dwelling was among the more sizable of the neighborhood and may have housed as many as seven family members in the late 1600s. To the right is the entryway to the house and the storage room foundation. So let's see. Right over here. And this um, is also the picture that you were able to see from the drilling. Um, was this area right here before it was fully excavated. Okay. Great Bay may have been a frontier zone in the 17th century, but from the fragments, we see colonists were also part of a globalizing world. Stoneware produced in the Rhenish region was the most durable pottery in Europe in the 17th century. The pottery made particularly in the Westerwald region of Germany was seen as a status symbol among the wealthy. Its elaborate decoration from medallions to sprig molding to combing lines and signature blue on gray glazing made it a valuable commodity on the frontier zone. These expensive trade goods show people were more connected than their remote locale might indicate. And also that some colonists were indeed seeing success in getting rich off of the commodification of the region's land and rich natural resource base. Other artifacts that usually are the star of interest would be kale and smoking pipes, um, bore measurements taken from the fragments recovered on the project date as early as 1620 to 1650 and all up through the 1700s. GBAS has found time and time again at 17th century British site after site, evidence of Native American presence and or interaction. Some sites have more evidence than others, which suggests relationships were diverse and dynamic, but there is not one site we have worked on where we did not find fragments showing the nonviolent presence of Native peoples. From the fragments we see in this frontier zone, there were nuanced relationships between colonial settlers and indigenous peoples. One of the most striking fragments evidencing nuanced relationships in this is this indigenous stone tool. We found this in the central hearth of this 17th century British house. In addition, food remains in the hearth were heavily indigenous, including corn, squash, moose, and birds. The British family was eating indigenous foods, which they would have had to acquire and learn to harvest from native peoples. They were displaying this indigenous stone tool also in the center of their hall. These kind of interactions lasted for much of the 17th century until post King Philip's War, 
violence ultimately spread from southern New England north into the late 1670s. This combined with depletions of resources Native peoples have long relied on, like the spawning fish um, blocked by the mill dams, as well as rising French and British tensions, meant Native American settler conflicts increased. A peak conflict of or a peak conflict in the region came with the Oyster River Massacre in 1694, which is a complicated event often told from the British perspective only, but that actually reflected global geopolitics between the French and English and what indigenous people became embroiled. While complicated, this did mark a turning point for native presence in the region. And from the 18th century on, Euro-American Euro Americans became the dominant presence. This garrison was not affected during the height of hostilities with Native Americans in the region in 1694 when numerous neighboring garrisons were destroyed. Today, celebrating and remembering an idealized version of the triumph of early British colonial history remains a strong current in the region. New Hampshire towns um, on indigenous lands such as Dover, Portsmouth, Rye, and Newcastle are celebrating with 400 year anniversaries this year. However, efforts are ongoing to reclaim native presence in the Great Bay. Here we see Paul Coolio examining a large stone outcrop. An article from 2019 in UNH's magazine UNH Today is titled A Land Called Indakina. And in this article, the picture is described as this. I'm touching this stone and wondering how it would have been used by my ancestors, Julio says. Maybe they would have sought temporary shelter here during a hunt or a move. His fingers trace a pair of tiny chips in nearly imperceptible curly cube patterns on one of the stone's flat surfaces that he suspects were made by native hands. Site areas like the Burnham Garrison are tribal as well as colonial, he says. GBAS expanded the survey to the surrounding area of the site, the initial site investigation, and further located sites establishing indigenous presence in the Great Bay Estuary. The collaboration with these regional and indigenous knowledge keepers uh, is integral to GBAS. So here we see the head speakers of the Kaosaw fans performing a traditional song titled Indakina and a blessing of the site during the field work. After we expanded the excavation, the survey um, revealed through a quite abundant mass of shovel test survey, um, the presence of a series of fire features. Um, these are all different sizes and have different appearances. This is um, one of them here after we have completely opened up a large excavation block and um, taken samples to float and do analysis with. This is a food processing feature. So the soil you'll see is stained um, a very bright orange color, which signifies that what was heated on it was to an extreme temperature. While excavating, um, there was quite a pungent odor coming from this soil, um, which was pretty interesting as well as some of the other fire features we excavated. Um, our indigenous partners believe that this would have been an elongated structure built over a fire to process different food remains, um, such as fish or other mammals. And then oils and fats would have secreted off, leaving remnants that can be seen clearly through this same soil. We found a series of post holes as well to support the evidence, um, or sorry, to support um, that there would have been structures built around these fires. Here is another example. Um, this one was pretty neat. It had an ash ring around it and 
It actually took two field seasons to excavate because we experienced um, a large amount of rain during the first year that kept flooding the pit, unfortunately. So um, that also kind of ties into the significance of a change in climate in the region as well. Um, through these excavations, the shovel tests, as well as the excavation blocks, we were able to um, identify a number of seeds, including gourd seeds and corn, which was very exciting. So again, indigenous presence here. These seeds have been tested and came back with a positive date of 12, um, 1200 AD. So it's very exciting. This is clearly a site with indigenous presence before settler colonists came to the area. Other materials from the site show continued occupancy through settler contact. We have both British gunflints as well as French. Um, you can tell by the different colors seen here and the flint mapping. And then, interestingly, you know, the faunal remains tell a large story as well. So as I mentioned before, indigenous foods such as moose, um, we also have turtle and oysters um, from the estuary. So in addition to the remains being butchered, we also find more personal objects um, such as uh, fork and knife handles, as well as the bone comb. That was pretty cool. So the survey continues. Um, much of what GVAS has found are fragments left behind during early colonists' everyday life. Here, reaching back 400 years, we see people were living through massive changes. They were navigating novel relationships with indigenous peoples. They were part of a newly globalizing world. They were, through their collective extractive economic practices, such as commercial fishing, lumbering, and farming, radically transforming the ecology of this region. But they um, also were experiencing their lives. So as we do day to day, they got dressed, they prepared food, they shared meals, they smoked pipes, and they built their houses. The archeology span and associated methods on this project shed light on the importance of how colonial legacies are inscribed into the environment. And around us, as we see these, the project gives power to efforts of reshaping these legacies. In closing, it is important to think about the future of heritage sites as climate change threatens cultural heritage across the globe. Of its varied impacts, sea level rise is critically pressing because of the long relationship between humans and the ocean. Numerous cultural heritage sites lie on the world's fragile coasts. For this reason, identifying cultural heritage sites at risk is a, an urgent need. In 2020, a GBAS study used sea level rise models to assess and quantify vulnerable cultural heritage sites near the Great Bay and in other coastal areas. The analysis showed there is no sea level rise scenario in which known historic and pre-contact sites are not damaged or even completely destroyed. No scenario. There is also impending risk to economically significant forest sites in the region, like in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, which is home to the Strawberry Bank Museum, as well as Hampton Beach. On this graphic, you can see Hampton, New Hampshire, as well as Seabrook, which borders Massachusetts. Um, the Hampton Seabrook Estuary is another large estuary system that is home to significant heritage sites. And as we can see from this graphic, it is threatened greatly by sea level rise. Okay, so I would like to thank the Massachusetts Archaeological Society for the opportunity to talk with you all tonight and would like to open it up for any questions. Um, and if anyone online has any questions, just put it in the chat and I will relay it. 
and everything. Um, I have a question for you. Yeah. Out of everything that you, or maybe not you directly, has discovered during this project, what is the favorite, coolest thing that you either found or you're like, I wish I was the one who had found that, even if it's just because it was pretty? That is always like <laughs> the golden question, yeah. right? Um, honestly, I would say that I have been very fortunate to work at sites um, clearly of both colonial um, settlement, but also ancestral. So seeing that kind of um, in comparison to each other, but also the interwoven um, relationships coming from those types of sites has been so rewarding. Um, I can't think of a specific artifact per se, but the features um, from the ancestral um, excavations were incredible to see. And features really are what get me excited about archeology, span so. Yeah. She just doesn't wanna to have to take anything back to the lab. <laughs> um, um, to preface that, we do, um, for these, uh, the series of fires that we did find, um, there was quite a lot of trekking out heavy bags to you know, do soil samples and flotations, which you know, was successful. We were able to get a number of seeds out of the floats, but also um, set some aside in the field for the testing, which is always a challenge to yes. try to make sure that nothing was touched inappropriately so that it can be accurately dated. Um, anyone in here? I got a few questions coming in online, anyone? Um, originally you said a lot of them built wood sawing and stuff like that. Did they stay in operation for a long term? Like are some of them still working? Yeah, so originally the mills would have been, um, well, a lot of them were sawmills for right. constructing um, and dealing with the mass amounts of lumber that was being extracted. Um, but some of the mills that I mentioned like the Mill Pond Dam, as well as the Exeter Great Dam, you know, they started as timber dams, but then over the centuries were then, you know, reconstructed with stronger materials and then were able to, um, you know, be utilized for more mass production. Like the original uh, Exeter Great Dam was a grist mill, and then it turned into a textile mill upon the gap, the improvement, yes. Yeah. Okay, you mentioned Strawberry Bank, and I'm ashamed to say I live in Essex. I've never ever been to Strawberry Bank. Oh um, no! But after tonight, I will be visiting with you. You should absolutely go to Strawberry Bank. But I, I understand. I've read some of these probably Yankee magazine or something like that. Uh, in the recent past, uh, that Strawberry Bank like, apparently is in great danger of being flooded out or whatever. Is there any you? Puddle Dock. Puddle Dock neighborhood, yes. Yeah. I'm going to skip all the way through back to that graphic at the end. So Puddle Dock was one of the, or is the first neighborhood um, in what is now Portsmouth, New Hampshire. And it is currently a living history museum. So they've restored um, houses from the original neighborhood and put them all into a very nice campus. Um, but over the, I want to say the last couple of years, they have had significant flooding to um, some of the houses, which it is right on the Piscataqua River. So it, the chance, I'm sorry, I totally went by. So flooding is absolutely a problem with the sea level rise. As you can see, the Piscataqua River um, connects directly to the Atlantic. So in that it's like the New Hampshire version of Woodman starting one of the flooding yeah. yeah. events. Is there anything that you know, is there anything that you know that uh, they can if you will build a levee or some kind of a barrier around Strawberry Bank to prevent the tide from encroaching in there? Or, uh, not having been there, I can't quite picture that. Unfortunately, I don't think that is something that can stop you know the problem from happening with the location the water is not just coming um like over a seawall it's it, it's inundating from below like the ground is being completely inundated that's the best word to describe it and we see this all along the coast um 
obviously inter um, inter inundation within the Great Bay estuary, but then down also with this other estuary system that's directly right on the coast. So they're seeing great inundation and flooding there. Apologize for coming late. I'm just getting back to you. Actually, work for you, man. I do. So I am I am the crew chief and lab manager for the Great Bay Archaeological Survey, um, which uh, takes place through UNH. Um, and uh, the director of this project, her name is Dr. Megan Howie, and she um, actually started this project in 2016 after receiving a professorship um, from the Center for Humanities at UNH. And the project is funded through that, as well as um, the Andrew Carnegie Foundation. A lot of sustainability happens in UNH. Which is great, too, because this project has been able to call on resources from the university. Um, you know, we're very lucky to have the Earth um, Systems Research Center, which has contributed greatly to this project as well. So, yes. I've driven through that general area several times over the years and never realized there was that large tidal area that far inland. Yes. And you, you got to wonder over the the several millennia since man has been in this area, what did that area look like? How much is under the Atlantic Ocean? I and, think about that all the yeah. time. Yeah. It's an amazing history and so much change. Yeah. That you gotta wonder how much is out there that we'll never see. There is um interestingly, I can tell you, um Genesis Beach, which is along the coast, um, would be south of this kind of Portsmouth area, there is a very, or not a very, an underwater forest there. Um, it's a very popular surfing location. Um, I do love surfing along the east coast of, of New Hampshire, but that has been pretty interesting to think about that we do know that there was a large forest in what is now covered by the Atlantic Ocean at Genesis Beach. Yeah. Okay. Well, get chief. How about you go, and then we'll start doing some of the ones coming in. Um, I'm, I am. So is this in that area? Yes. Is it going to be like the the take for it to to remove that? And then, I mean, is it keeping a lot of water? I'm trying to get the neighboring area. Yeah. So. The tide dams, as I mentioned before, are of the most damaging because they do block that natural flow of um, water from, you know, important aspects of the ecosystem. So the fish not being able to travel upriver and spawn um, as they would naturally be able to do. Um, but what we've been seeing is that this is a very contentious thing to address, um, you know, coming from this background in archaeology, it's been interesting because I do very much respect the, the importance of keeping historical landmarks and many towns see these dams as just that. So there is kind of this argument that we're getting rid of this really important piece of history um, by removing the dams. And there is a great expense also with taking these dams out, but also maintaining them. So that's something that has to be, you know, weighed in on the process as well. Um, but when you kind of take a step back and you think about how the natural environment was before these dams were in place, you know, that's really what the importance is. It's really contributing to a much healthier ecosystem. It's like which historical landscape are you actually keeping? Right, and that goes- Privileging a white historical exactly. landscape. It's kind of, you know, it's kind of flood right. a lot of the, the neighboring countries from right on that river. Right. Keep it first. Maybe eventually it'll be back to its natural form where it's supposed to be. Exactly. At least that can. But sometimes it actually can help with the real flooding that nature is doing. Like you think like the Portsmouth, yeah. 
Yeah, um, this it's just funny because um, one of our first questions in here is related to fish, and I'll get to that. But um, it's just not New Hampshire. So you guys are from Essex. I live in Ipswich, and we have a head of river dam um, at where EBSCO is yeah. in downtown Ipswich. It is a big conversation for us too, right? And everything. Um, so one of the first questions we have in here, I don't know if you can answer it, okay. but it is, have there been any attempts to restore the, I may butcher this, the Andromenus fish to the region? You had talked about like- Yeah, so that would include these kinds of fish that yeah. spawn, um, well, that would travel from mm -hmm. salt water to fresh water and back. So I know that they're definitely, must be efforts um, <laughs> towards this end. Um, I can't speak yeah. to any specifically, but I do know that um, like federal organizations, for example, such as like the US Fish and Wildlife Service do try to um, yeah, supplement I mean, these. Either areas. bringing back indigenous plants and animals or getting rid of invasive species is actually a climate resiliency strategy. Right. Um, which oddly does intersect with archaeology yeah. in a lot of different ways when you talk about this it's stuff. A great example of um, that you and might be U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, but the uh, Horn Pond, does anyone know Horn Pond Rover? Well, you go to be in, in the main park, and like, you go to the right, and there's a river, I think it's maybe the Mystic, whatever river, you come in there, when it, there's starting down here, June, May, June, there's tons and tons of fish that climb up that yeah. 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 opening. They yeah. climb up that opening just to bring the little tiny teeny tiny in. And so it's it's yeah they have people there doing knots, counting the fish yeah. the right. So I think the USG, US Fish and Wildlife might be Massachusetts might be a combination. But that's an example of you see that in action. Yeah. One of them is maybe a um, so we, we have another question. Of the indigenous stone tools found, do you know the purpose of many of them, especially the larger one in that first photo? I think the one that was found in the house. Yes, um, so the one from the garrison house was most likely, or is most likely, um, a uh, hand axe that would have been used to like process different materials. And importantly to the answer for that question, um, there are a plethora of uses for stone tools and they all are you know, for different purposes, whether that is um, grinding materials, um, like a native example could be um, hickory or uh, egg corn, stuff like that, um, to make into like a flower and like, even to go a bit further, a ground stone tool um, could have different um, surface texture to, you know, more directly create the kind of fine grained material you would want or a more coarse grained material. Um, plummets are another really um, interesting stone tool to me that would have been used for fishing net weights. Um, so there are so many different purposes yes. and uses for indigenous stone tools. Um, but it's very cool to see on this project, again, that interface of the tools being found in early colonial. Houses. I always am curious too, because it's just human nature, right? You have your tool that you know how you're supposed to use it. And then what is the weird one-off? Like, and I thought of this being an archeologist this weekend when I had a hammer in my house, because I had to nail something in. And then I saw a spider. <laughs> and I'm not gonna lie, it suddenly was being used to get rid of that. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, John, and then we'll do our last question online. I wonder if the um, indigenous tools that you're finding in the um, Euro American tools were sort of stratigraphically uh, separate. Mm -hmm. That um, is a great question. Um, so these sites obviously are very different. Um, so the tool that was found in the hearth was commingled, obviously, because it had um, found its place there. So we did find it among other um, colonial artifacts. Um, from the features that we're seeing, the there was um, a separate a separance in the stratigraphy 
where we were seeing um, a lot of mixed colonial items, whether that was brick or earthenware like Staffordshire, um, much further above where we found the features. Um, and I think a part of that too is that we were digging in um, what was a plow zone. So of course on top, you're going to find a lot of mixture of things, but then underneath something completely different when you get down past the plow zone. Yeah. I saw the photo of the field. I mean, that's a large area. How did you focus on that area where you did the deep? Was it LIDAR or was it radar or some other thing that you went over the whole field and then you settled on that spot? So we did go over pretty much the entirety of the field before we found our first feature. So um, that happens, you know, we had to make a pretty large survey grid and test across, but we felt pretty confident that the area was worth devoting the time to, um, to really go over um, by shovel test pits. And that um, has come to be one of my favorite parts of archeology span is doing shovel test pits, which is good because that's a big part of it. But um, yeah, it was definitely an expansive survey of that area. And no human remains. No human remains. So, oh, thank God. No, no, no. So no one ever wants to find that. No we do not want to find that. Yeah, that is not what you want to find. You do not want to have to call the medical examiner no. in the middle of your thing. No, so the Great Bay Archaeological Survey, I can say with full confidence to this point, has just been about material culture. No human remains have been identified or investigated on this project. So typically nowadays in archaeology, unless it's a recovery thing for a specific project to move it out of like a flood zone area, yeah. um, archaeologists try and avoid uh, any place there might be unmarked graves or anything like that. We don't want to disturb the dead. Um, we want to leave them where they are and everything. Um, and yep. and the area that we were surveying, we felt confident that we wouldn't come across yeah. that because of, that wouldn't be a traditional kind of area that mm -hmm. the Abenaki would have buried their yeah. um, ancestors. Um, so. So our last question is, was there any discovery of British or French redwares or slipwares of more in, which are more interest to this person? And if there was discovery for the introduction of domestically made redwares or stonewares? Yes, so we have a very impressive um, kind of array of ceramics on the project. So I would definitely suggest going to our story map because we do have pictures of all the different kinds of ceramics we have found on the project, um, which are quite interesting. There's, you know, as I mentioned before, Staffordshire, but also um, very impressive examples of Westerwald as well as the redware, which have, would have been used more for like everyday, day-to-day -day life, whereas you know, the Westerwald example that we showed would have been to break out during those fancy. Red, <laughs> redware is the Tupperware of its time. Yeah, so lots of redware, um, which is quite fun when you're also dealing with a lot of brick and trying to kind of, you know, piece through them. So yeah, lots of really interesting ceramics that you can find on our, on our story map. Um. Well, thank you. I think those were all the questions we have. So let's please give let's another round of applause. We appreciate them. Um, and we will see everyone next month when we have uh, Kim Casper, who will be talking about botanicals. So see you then. Thank you.